welcome back everybody uh yeah akash raj thank you uh please teach as much as you can thank you uh, i have yeah but you know this has taken quite a substantial part of my time uh, just uh, mental time and also physical time actually so uh, what i think is that we can have a you know if if uh, anybody is interested in organizing it we can have a part 2 for the people who have attended part 1 so i'll start from where i end this part but uh, this part will end on wednesday so that's the first announcement so this wednesday day after tomorrow there'll be one more lecture and that's uh, that's the last lecture of this uh, set okay so extra lecture wednesday august fourth same usual time so everything as usual and with that i'll complete riemannian manifolds so let's start now so uh, in the last few lectures we have defined vector fields and differential forms and they have a dual kind of relation and we also defined a riemannian metric and the all important concept of orthonormal frames now uh you may have noticed that in all this we've learned how to differentiate so we've done one part of the job of calculus on manifolds because um we learned how to do a uh, differentiation uh, of uh, differential forms using exterior derivative we also learned that vector fields act as derivatives of a kind x on fg is xf times g plus f times xg which is like a derivative we haven't yet learned how to differentiate any arbitrary vector field or differential or 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 the member of its dual space uh we've only learned a very specialized kind of derivative called exterior derivative which is anti symmetric intrinsically but very important so there are more general derivatives called covariant derivatives and that will be the subject uh today uh and that with that we'll complete our survey of differentiation on manifolds and next time on wednesday in a single lecture i'll talk about integration on manifolds now integration is always more difficult than differentiation uh it's because differentiation look zooms in on a very small part of the function and asks how the function is varying near a point integration on the other hand zooms far away wants to see the whole function over a range and wants to compute the area under it it's a more complicated business altogether and on a manifold it's a real problem because here for differentiation uh, it was relatively easy because we said look in worst case just differentiate in some coordinate system and then Uh, we'll patch up things uh, in different coordinate systems by having these transition functions to go from x coordinates to y coordinates so that our derivatives our vector fields and differential forms will ultimately be well defined everywhere that was fine now how about integration we can't get by uh, by integrating on one coordinate patch supposing we want to integrate over a large part of the manifold or supposing we want to integrate over the whole manifold one coordinate patch is no good so it's a little more complicated and uh, so that's next time today is this and next time is uh, integration on manifolds needless to say we'll have to just give a brief survey of it but integration has some fun things you know about stokes theorem gauss law these kind of laws Uh, that transfer one integration to another and similar things will hold on general manifold so it's quite good fun okay now before we embark on covariant derivatives a brief comment on the pseudo riemannian case so 
uh, I had actually uh, a vague memory that pseudo Riemannian geometry is discussed in the book. Of course, it's not discussed in my book at all. And uh, so I'll have to tell you a little about it, as little as possible because of shortage of time. Uh, and the main thing I want to say is the following. Um, we defined orthonormal frames last time. And we called them E A and um, also their duals, uh, which were one forms E upper A. Okay. And we said that these transform, these are, are uh, scalars under, so they are scalars under general coordinate transformation. GCT stands for general coordinate transformation, but transform as vectors of O n, where n is the dimension of the manifold. And this O n is the group of rotations of the orthonormal frames. A group of rotations of frames will be some matrices, in general, any invertible matrices. But if you want to preserve the lengths of everybody in that frame, uh, since it's not in a normalized frame, that's what the normal means in orthonormal, then it has to be uh, by orthogonal matrices only. Okay, now we can uh, generalize this structure as follows. And this generalization became essential from the time Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity. And after that, even the mathematicians like Levi Civita and Kartan and so on, who were contemporaries and lived for some time after that, uh, incorporated those motivations into their work. I'm not an expert on their work, so I can't tell you if they wrote something specific about pseudo Riemannian geometry, but they, I, I think Kartan did actually, but they certainly uh, used inspiration from GR uh, in, in their theorems. But there was a lot of work before that by Riemann and uh, Christoffel and other people, uh, which obviously didn't make use of GR because it was many decades before. Okay, so let's generalize as follows. First of all, the metric G mu nu uh, no longer satisfies positivity. Uh, which is that um, the inner product of two tangent vectors in G uh, is equal to zero if and only if A equals B. We just get rid of this postulate, okay? Secondly, uh, we choose, uh, now we'll still keep calling it a metric, but it's not a metric in the old definition because of this postulate, uh, but we'll choose metrics G mu nu of signature minus minus plus plus plus. That means the eigenvalues of this Hermitian matrix G mu nu in any coordinate system are uh, have these signs minus plus plus plus. Okay, uh, and three, uh, we'll replace the orthonormal frames. This becomes necessary in view of the above, replaced by Lorentzian. I don't know if this is an official terminology, but Lorentzian frames, which transform under O n minus one comma one, which is called the Lorentz group. Okay, so let's say a few words about this. Basically the coordinates under this pseudo Riemannian geometry, uh, let's work usually in four dimensions, but this generalizes to any dimension. Instead of taking them to be X1 up to Xn, I'll now take them to be CT uh, X1, X2 dot dot dot. So uh, this is the minus eigenvalue, the first one and the others, other directions are the plus eigenvalues. C is going to be set equal to one as a choice of units and X mu, 
will be the vector starting with x0, which is the same as t, and then going on to x1 up to xn minus 1. So now with the resulting uh, manifold, which was a differentiable manifold of dimension n, is now a uh, um, what we what do we call it a space time manifold with one time and n minus one space dimensions. Okay. Uh, now, mathematically, uh, this does have interesting consequences. There's absolutely no time to uh, discuss them here. They are discussed in the textbook of Hawking and Ellis and pretty much any formal textbook on GR, Wald's textbook, for example. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the mathematical niceties, but all the definitions that we gave of vector fields, differential forms, etc., all go through without much change. So there's really no change in this definition, in this definition. This definition, the change we saw is that, uh, so first of all, these first two definitions don't depend on the metric. Hmm? That relieves us a lot that actually, since they never depended on the metric, there can't be any change in those, in going from Riemannian to pseudo Riemannian. Okay, so here it should be a pseudo Riemannian metric. And here, uh, ON is replaced by O, uh, I don't remember whether I called it n, I think I called it n minus one comma one. Some people call it one comma n minus one. It hardly makes any difference. Okay. Now it's a very different group uh, in many ways. It's also very similar in many ways, uh, but it's a non-compact group. That's another whole story. This new one, O n minus one comma one and the Lorentz group. And one of the best references to study representations of the Lorentz group is actually the book which I wrote with Mukunda in Mukunda's half of it, okay, which is on Lie groups and Lie algebras. But in particular, unlike many books on Lie algebras, textbooks, it spends quite a lot of time developing the mathematics of the Lorentz group and Lorentz algebra. And I think that's extremely important and I very strongly recommend it to you. Okay, so this is pretty much all I'll be saying about this generalization to pseudo, the pseudo Riemannian case. But from now on, we'll keep a sort of open mind that whatever we are discussing, even though we'll use words like ON and orthonormal frames, uh, we'll be uh, open to the idea that these formulae extend to the pseudo Riemannian case also. Uh, maybe it's not needed to be said, but just recall, let's, let's just recall one thing about the Lorentz group. So O n is defined as matrix n by n matrices satisfying O transpose O equals one, and Lorentz O, which is O n minus one comma one, uh, is defined by matrices capital lambda, not to confuse with the wedge products. I'm sorry, satisfying lambda transpose eta lambda equals eta where eta is the matrix minus one, one dot 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 one. Okay, so it's not the group of matrices which are orthogonal, but it is uh, pseudo orthogonal, which means instead of preserving, you see the first one can be thought of as preserving the identity because I could have put the identity in between here, does nothing. So it says that if I take identity and act with O on the right and O transpose on the left, I get identity back. That defines O, the orthogonal group. If I replace the role of identity with the Minkowski metric uh, that I've just written here, which arises in special relativity, then the Lorentz group is the group of matrices which acting as lambda on the right and lambda transpose on the left preserve this metric. Now in the Euclidean case, uh, rotations preserve the length of a spatial vector, but in uh, the Lorentzian case, the Lorentz transformations preserve the generalized length, which is actually the space-time interval, t squared minus x squared minus, or minus t squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that's all I have to say. And now let's uh, move on. Uh, let me take if there are any brief questions. We have a few different things to cover today. So, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, the questions are all encouraging me to continue. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm happy to do that. If you like, you can be in touch with Shudipta and ask him, or you can ask me, or you can ask anyone to organize part two of this. But please give me a few months because now in the coming semester, I'll be teaching uh, at ISER. Hmm? Okay, good. So now let's get back to our favorite thing for which we embarked on this whole project, which is differentiation. And now, uh, recall that we had exterior derivative d, which acting on a one form, for example, a equals a mu dx mu, sends it to dA, which is del nu a mu dx nu wedge dx mu. This we did last time. And the rule is always put the new uh, sorry, there's a bad pun, new N-E-W, not N-U. Uh, always put the, the last dx in front, the one which is created by differentiation, which is dx upper new. Put it in front, not at the back. There could be a minus sign difference, so we have to uh, fix one convention. Okay, and del new, subscript new is just shorthand for del by del x new. I avoided it till now, but now we'll really need to use this notation. You probably know it. Okay. Now this was fine, and we also realized that you can act uh, using D on any differential form, which is an anti-symmetrized form, and it will give you a form uh, of one higher rank, okay, with one more dx in it, okay. But now we introduced frames, and we haven't thought yet about combining exterior derivative with frames. So using frames, uh, we defined uh a a as uh e upper mu a a mu okay and while these are components of a differential form the left side are not and that's the whole point of frames uh, they remove the differential form for you so these are scalars under general coordinate transformation, GCT, but they are uh, ON vectors. So they rotate under ON. Now they are also one forms. They're still one forms. They didn't stop being one forms after we did this because, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. They are not one forms, they are scalars. So as I said, they are scalars, but they are ON vectors. Now, sorry, I, I said something wrong. Uh, this is correct. But now, supposing we want to differentiate this. Differentiate these objects, which are ON vectors. So never before did we try to act with exterior derivative on ON vectors, but we are entitled to act with it on any scalar with respect to the general coordinate transformations. These are scalars, so we can act with D, or we should be entitled to act with D on this. And what we get is quite straightforward. We get del mu of AA dx mu, which is the one form, okay? The problem is this perfectly good one form because D acting on any scalar uh, is a one form. And it's always the derivative of that scalar times dx mu, and that's a one form, it can't go wrong, okay? But this one form does not transform properly, and we'll see what that means, under ON anymore. So previously, AA was a scalar which transformed as, an, as a vector under ON and scalar under general coordinate transformations. The new thing is a mess. It's, it's a vector under general coordinate transformations, but it doesn't transform properly under ON rotations. So let's show that. Okay, uh, under ON, uh, A, A goes to A prime A, which is uh, equal to lambda, well, so now I have to choose a notation for my ON matrices, and I'm going to deliberately choose the notation I used for uh, Lorentz transformations, namely lambda, but we'll allow lambda to be an ON matrix or an ON minus one comma one matrix, Either for either one, these statements will generically be true, okay? If uh, we were in the Lorentzian case, then this is exactly uh, how a 
vector of the Lorentz group transforms under Lorentz transformations. So this is your x prime equals x minus vt over gamma, etc. It's all built into this. Okay, I don't know if special relativity was taught to you in the proper mathematical framework. It's useful to go over it once and there are good references you can look up for that. Okay, so this is how this worked. But now remember that we have an ON group for every point of the manifold because there's a tangent space at each point of the manifold. Okay, so in general, this is a function on the manifold, a scalar function. So this will also be, and we haven't changed the coordinate system. This is not a general coordinate transformation. So if it was function of X on the left, it's still a function only of X. And this is a function of X, but this is also a function of X because in principle, it's a low, it's a Lorentz transformation independently for every point of the manifold continuously varying. Okay, because the frames were defined all over the manifold in a continuous and differentiable way, and they can be transformed all over the manifold again in a continuous and differentiable way. So lambda depends on X in general. So now let's see what happens to DAA, uh, or rather let's see what happens to DAA prime. This is D of lambda AB, AB. This is now, uh, lambda a b d a b plus d lambda um, a b times a d now you see uh, original a uh, capital a had a small a index which said it's a vector under the lorentz transformations or frame rotations and d a also has one index so it should also be a vector uh, under the same transformations. And so this is a good term, but the problem is this is a bad term. This says that the DA no longer transforms as a vector because there's an extra term. Okay. So this tells us that the exterior derivative is not a good, not a good uh, operator on O n vectors. And of course, we can generalize to O n tensors. It won't be good on any of them, okay? We can even, we can refer the components of a vector field to O n and whatever we do, as long as the thing now transforms under O n is never going to transform well after we act with an exterior derivative D on it. So we generalize uh, D for this purpose. Now, again, it's good to remember that we invented D for a slightly different purpose. We invented D to work on differentiable manifolds where nothing Riemannian had been introduced. There was no metric. There it did its job, fine. Now, we've added a new structure on the manifold, which is a Riemannian metric, which is an inner product on tangent vectors, okay? And that also in, in, induces an inner product on differential forms. And now that we have these new inner products it is not at all. And then frames came from that. Okay, once we had the metric, it was natural to define frames uh, because, other, because previously we couldn't say any, what was the definition of normalized or orthogonal. Okay, because orthonormal means orthogonal and normalized, but these concepts are referred to a metric. Okay, two vectors will be orthogonal in a given choice of metric. Otherwise the question doesn't make sense. Okay, so it's not given that the exterior derivative D which works so beautifully in the context of differentiable manifolds will continue to work well on Riemannian manifolds with frames and indeed it doesn't. So we have to generalize it. And the idea is to define a new exterior, a new covariant exterior derivative D such that, um, let's see, such that D A, A uh, has the usual term, which gave me an, an unwanted result, plus a new term depending on uh, a coefficient matrix omega A B of X times A B. So in other words, geometrically, 
The first term is performing the exterior derivative of this vector capital A referred to the frame basis. Okay. The second term is performing a local rotation of the same vector. Okay. So what we are basically saying is we, when we differentiated it, it didn't transform as a vector anymore. Maybe if we perform a suitable local rotation at the same time that we differentiate it and add the two, this whole new thing might be uh, able to transform as an ON vector. Okay. Now, why did we add the new thing in this form? Because of linearity. If we want that a vector capital A, A, O n vector um, has an exterior, has a, has a generalized or covariant derivative capital D A, uh, then, and if we want that any constant two or three or 10 times capital A will have an exterior derivative capital 10 times D A, then it has to be linear in A. Okay, and the most general thing you can do, which is linear in a vector of O n, is to do an uh, is to do a rotation of that vector. Okay, by a matrix. Matrix by definition is a linear transformation. So this is the most general thing. We don't know anything about omega yet, but we are about to find out. Okay, now omega has one hidden attribute. Uh, you see that this was a general coordinate transformation scalar. But this is a, uh, well, it, it's nothing because it has an extra term. But if you focus on the first term, this one, then at least it looks like, a gen sorry, actually it is. This is a general coordinate transformation vector. It's messed up as a vector of ON, but it's a good vector of general coordinate transformations. Okay. So therefore, uh, the second term also has to be, well, sorry, vector was not a good word, one form. GCT one form. Now look on this, this second term. Capital A is a GCT scalar. So the one form has to be here. So this must be a GCT one form. So omega AB is really omega mu AB DX mu. Okay. So the whole thing is uh, del mu AA plus omega mu AB A b dx mu because uh, exterior differentiation has a, is a package which always puts a dx mu at the end of whatever it does so omega really has three indices but one of them is associated to being a gct1 form the other two are associated to om so it's a hybrid object okay so that you should uh, and the notation takes care of that mu is the GCT index because it's the index we put on our coordinates x mu and whenever we change coordinates it will be that index which plays a role while a and b were the indices we put on our frames capital e and small e so whenever we do a frame index a rotation those indices will play a role good okay now uh, we want to require by all that i've said we want to require that this should be Lambda a b uh, d a b. The whole idea of choosing an omega and adding it here is that the result, including the omega term, so including this term, this total quantity should continue to transform as an O n vector, which it did before we differentiated it. Okay, and that means that under O n, this is how it should transform. So this is like a requirement. So if we impose this requirement, it's very simple. Uh, we have D A prime A is un, in a new system is D A, A, A prime plus omega prime A B, A B prime. Now this prime refers to a new frame, not a new coordinate system, but a rotated frame. Okay. And we've put a prime on omega because we don't know what it will do. We have to find out how it's going to transform. Okay. Now we plug in what we know. So A prime A is just lambda AB, AB. Omega prime we leave undetermined because we don't know what it is. And here we put lambda BC, AC. Oops. Something disastrous happened. Yeah. AC. Okay. 
Now this uh, D acting on these things, we do, we um, uh, what's the word? Distribute it over both of them. So it's D lambda A B A B. It's much easier to do this in mat in in matrix and vector notation. But anyway, let's just be pedantic and plow on. You can easily reproduce these uh, calculations. Okay, and if you collect all these terms, you can write this as lambda A B into d a b that's this term plus lambda inverse b c remember lorentz transformations are invertible d lambda c d a d this is this term uh, and finally lambda inverse uh, b c omega prime c d lambda d e a E. That's this term, where I took out an, a lambda a b, and so I had to put a lambda inverse by hand. The rest of it is just this. Hmm? Okay. Now uh, it is really much easier to write this in uh, matrix notation. So let's write it once. Uh, this is uh, d a equals lambda d a plus lambda inverse d lambda a plus lambda inverse omega lambda a. You see how much easier everything is without indices. Only you have to not forget that A is an ON vector and everything else in this are matrices. Okay, so here we have a, a vector, then matrix, 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 vector, matrix, matrix, uh, vector, matrix. Okay, so under that, you can easily put in the indices yourself. Now, from this, it immediately follows that uh, omega, this is an exercise, I'll leave it for you, it's very easy exercise, that omega prime is lambda omega lambda inverse uh, minus, signs are quite important here, minus d lambda lambda inverse. Okay, this is a very important equation. Now, notice that the omega has two indices a and b, right? Uh, and so if it transforms under ON rotations, it should have uh, two factors uh, of transformation, one for each of those indices. So it has two lambdas, but one acts on the first index of omega, the other acts on the second. The one that acts on the second index can be recast as lambda inverse because it's really a transpose. Transpose acts on the second index. So. Uh, so this is the normal transformation of a second rank, that means with two indices, O n tensor, and this is the extra term. So here we have to we have introduced a quantity omega, which is not an which does transform under O n but not as a tensor, rather with an inhomogeneous term. Inhomogeneous because even if omega was zero to start with, omega prime would be non-zero due to this term. Hmm. So it doesn't transform, it's not linear. It doesn't transform in a way that it's linear, but not homogeneous. So it doesn't transform such that uh, if, if original omega was doubled, then new omega prime is doubled. That's not true, okay? So we have to accept this. And this quantity uh, goes by the name of spin connection. Now, the reason for this term <coughs> is that ON, as well as its counterpart, the Lorentz group, have a special class of representations called spinner representations, though we are not using those right now. We'll use them in a few minutes, but right now we have not used any spinner representation. We've used the fact that uh, frames uh, give us vectors and tensors of ON. Vectors in the obvious way, just take a general coordinate vector, contract it with a frame. We did that right at the beginning. And you'll get a, this one. And you'll get a um, ON vector. Now you can just take products of these and linear combinations of those, and you'll get ON tensors. OK? So we are only using the vector and tensor representations of ON. But the spin connection. Uh, does an important job. So to summarize, D of a ON vector AA will be D of AA 
plus omega a b a b now supposing i had a tensor of o n for a genuine tensor supposing i had a tensor t a b of o n or it could be a tensor of the lorentz group there are such things in physics for example the field strength tensor the energy momentum tensor plenty of tensors uh, available in uh, are used in in physics now what is d of it so this we have to learn this rule by using the first rule and combining vectors into tensors uh, but the answer is very simple it's d a b d t a b plus omega a c t c b plus omega a uh, sorry b c t a c so if you you can easily remember this rule if you remember this rule it says just apply this rule to each index so what's the rule this was the index a replace it by b and put an omega so here this was the index replace it by c and put an omega we didn't call this b because there's already a b then add another term where this index gets replaced by c and you put an omega which rotates that so it's like you add up a rotation uh, uh, it's not exactly a rotation but you add up an omega acting on each of the indices independently that's the rule for this and the claim is that then uh, and easily generalizes and the claim is that with this definition d of any tensor of on is again a tensor of on and moreover it becomes a one form because d makes any general coordinate scalar into a one form okay good so we've completed that now there are a couple of uh, important comments uh, and definitions but before that let's take a quick look at the questions it is like poincare group in qft akash not sure poincare group i believe is a group of translations i don't think we brought in translations here uh yeah is it uh, rithvik says is it necessary to have a metric for this construction absolutely because um without that uh well okay is it necessary um mm -hmm. well the the point is that without a metric there would be no concept of on so we, what is the question we are asking okay there would be no meaning to saying that omega prime is this this formula would not have a meaning without a metric because this quantity lambda in fact without a metric and frames okay so you need a metric and frames in order to have this discussion you can define yeah you can define frames as linearly independent vectors yes they will be gl vectors you are right to it but uh, i yeah i yeah so yeah rabsan you are right i mean of course you can't define orthonormal without inner product derivative is or isomorphic to translation okay maybe that's true all right anyway it looks like the things that i am doing in uh, precisely here in detail are uh, understandable i don't know about whether it can be or makes sense to generalize it but in the context of frames we can't do without this spin connection in order to uh, to 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 let these derivatives act okay now uh, there's a question uh, which will differ uh, is the is omega ab unique and the answer will be no and we'll see that only after you put some supplementary conditions it will become unique so we'll talk about those in a minute now uh, two comments so there are two interesting tensors that arise from our definition of exterior covariant derivative d one is you could ask yourself well i seem to remember that there were some one forms uh, e upper a which were the dual frames hmm? yeah you remember that these were dual to the capital e capital e's were vector fields so these are dual uh, one forms okay so what is d capital d acting on this it's an interesting question 
because uh, if you are allowed to act with D on O n vectors, then in particular we can act with D on one uh, and and also on general coordinate one forms. Then here we have a nice example of something which is both an O n vector and a general coordinate one form. So we can act with D on it, and the result is guaranteed to be a general coordinate two form because it's exterior derivative and an O n tensor because uh, it's a uh, sorry and an O n vector. Excuse me. Excuse me. So the result will be a GCT two form and O n vector. Okay. So we simply give it a name. We define T a equals D e a. We call it the the torsion two form. So it's a two form, but it's a one component. It has one uh, O n index, so it's an O n vector, as I've written above. And this, of course, by definition, is d e a plus omega a b e d. Okay. Uh, actually, in this context, I had mentioned once that raising and lowering indices is no big deal for the uh, orthogonal group because they preserve the identity metric, and in identity metric, there's nothing like raised and lowered index. In Lorentz uh, or Minkowski metric, there is because there's a sign change. So in order to keep that in mind, we are try to be a little careful, but it's not going to be my strong point to keep these upper and lower correct. For GCT, we'll always keep it correct because upper and lower in GCT, upper and lower coordinates have completely different meanings. They relate to vector fields and differential forms. Hmm. But for ON, it's not so important. The only thing that could go wrong is a sign. In any case, uh, I think we write it in this way. Uh, very often people will just write it in this way. Uh, and for the Euclidean signature case, this is also fine. For Lorentz signature, we should be, uh, we should have a definite uh, thing. And uh, for Lorentz signature, we can get this from the original omega by using the Minkowski metric to raise the first A and lower the second B. So whatever, anyway. So here's the torsion two form, good. So what are we going to do with it? Well, obviously it captures some aspect of the geometry, we don't know what, of the Riemannian geometry. It's a ge geometry, of course, we have not just done Riemannian geometry, that as well as frames. Okay, so you could call this Cartan type of geometry. Cartan is the one who I think explored this, these kind of formulas and many are due to him. Okay, so that's one interesting tensor that arises. It's not a tensor, actually, it's a two form. So I should have said two interesting two forms. The second one arises by asking a nice question. We saw that D squared equals zero. Precisely that means that if I take D times D on omega, where omega is a normal one form, we get zero. And the reason is very simple. D squared is the same as del mu del nu dx nu wedge dx mu wedge. Hmm, wedge whatever is there. So this differentiates the thing omega we had to start with. And it puts in these two uh, things in the wedge product. But these two are anti-symmetrized. And these two derivatives, of course, commute. And that's the reason it's zero. Last time we saw it in a different way, but it's very obvious that d squared because of the anti-symmetrization in this wedge product is zero. Okay, but what about d squared, capital D squared? Is that also zero? And if it's not zero, what is it? Turns out it's not zero. And the best way to find out is to take d squared and act on an O n vector, a a. This a last a could have been up or down, doesn't change the formula. So what is this? This is d of d a a. So that is d of uh, d a a plus omega a b a b. So this is now d of that whole thing plus uh, omega 
Um, sorry, I keep doing this. Okay, plus uh, omega A C D A C plus omega C B A. Uh, This, I think I got it right. Okay, so this is what you get if you act twice with capital D. The first action of capital D gives you this quantity and this, uh, which is the same as this. The next action, you take D on that quantity plus omega on that quantity because the quantity we had this one uh, after one application of D was still an O-N vector. And we are guaranteed that however many Ds, capital Ds we put, we'll keep getting ON vectors because we're not doing anything to that ON index, okay? But the differential form index will go up, okay? So there's nothing, uh, so in this, of course, the first term is zero. So we get D squared AA and this is equal to zero, but nothing else really looks uh, likely to be zero. So we get D omega AB AB plus omega a b d a b plus omega a c d a c um ah ah i forgot one thing this sign is not plus uh this sign is minus why is that because this d to get here and act on a it had to skip through omega but omega is a one form and the derivative d carries a one form, it's a dx mu, it has a dx mu in it. That one, when it goes through a one form, uh, brings about a change of sign because anti-symmetry of the dx is, okay? So that's why the minus sign here, that's very important. And then uh, the last term is uh, omega ac, omega cb, ab. Now, I don't expect you to follow all the details, but actually the, in this case, it's pretty simple. I just expanded out everything. The nice thing though, is that two terms cancel these two. And so we are left with a very elegant expression, D omega AB plus omega AC omega CB AB, which in fact uh, can be just written as D omega plus omega squared, thinking of omega as a matrix, AB, AB. So that's beautiful. We've got a new tensor. And what is it as a form? So it's a two form. Because here, omega is, um, is a, okay, I probably forgot to put in, when I wrote it in components, I forgot to put in those uh, DXs. Uh, so this was fine, up to here was all fine. Uh, yeah, no, this is still fine. This is a two form, okay? The only thing I think which I should have done uh, is that since there are two omegas, the product between these two omegas is really a wedge product and I was a bit lazy about writing that. So it's really omega AC wedge. And here I should be very careful writing that. There. So here's a two form. So this two form uh, has a part of it is just uh, D of our original spin connection. Uh, but our original spin connection was not, uh, remember, a, a proper ON uh, vector, but it was a one form. So D of that is a two form. Omega wedge omega is also two form. Now you may wonder how I'm allowed to wedge anything with itself. Don't I automatically get zero? And the trick is that omega is also a matrix and matrix multiplication doesn't commute. So if I wedge a matrix valued one form, see it's a one form, omega is a one form with AB indices, making it a matrix in ON, okay, with respect to ON. So now omega wedge omega, if you work it out, is actually a kind of matrix commutator, okay? And that's not necessarily zero. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is the answer. And this two form has a name, uh, just like the previous one was called the torsion two form. We define uh, R 
a b which is equal to d omega plus omega which omega a b is called the curvature two form okay so we have two interesting two forms one is a on vector called the torsion where did it go oh it's above here defined by taking d on the one form dual frames and then we have another two form which is also a on tensor second rank tensor okay and that's defined by carrying out capital d covariant derivative twice on a on vector and gct scalar capital a this one okay good so what do we make of these things so we have ta uh, equals ta mu nu dx mu where's dx nu and we have r a b equals r a b mu nu dx mu where's dx nu so all together this r has two general coordinate indices because it's a two form and also has two on indices because it's an on tensor so it's a hybrid kind of object good now there's a nice exercise which you can check uh d there's a relation between these dt if i take another if i take another d on t i'll get r um uh, a b wedge e b because remember t was d on e b and d squared is r so this is an easy relation what happens if i take d r so r already was obtained by taking two d's on an a i take a third one and i find a very interesting result i get d r a b plus this is the definition of it omega a c wedge r c b plus omega c b wedge r a c and one can check that all this together is equal to 0 and this is called the bianchi identity now at some point we need to talk about what is the geometric meaning of all these the mathematical properties are very nice and very simple um we've defined given their definitions and we've given some properties of this and these two exercises you can easily do but what are we going to do with all this well it turns out that uh the riemannian or pseudo riemannian fold is captured by the pair ta and r ab and we call this the curvature so this we already gave it a name torsion and this i said was riemann tensor we can also call it curvature tensor now there are some deep reasons why this thing is called a curvature they have to do with uh, uh, with, with with fiber bundles and curvature of uh, of certain spaces um but um broadly speaking it would be correct to say that these actually capture the curvature behavior of the manifold namely how the manifold is curved in different uh, regions so it's a tensor and a function all over the manifold and it's supposed to capture this curvature now one way to make contact with that uh, many of you must have seen some amount of general relativity from gr textbooks and you must be thinking this looks similar but not quite the same as what we do in gr and indeed it's not the same and the reason is that in gr curvature is introduced making use of orthonormal frames in fact i'm not sure if orthonormal frames were actually available uh, uh, to einstein because uh, i know that this was carta uh, this was carton's work but it was carton's life uh, went you know parallel to some extent to einstein's so but i think it was later and it could well have been inspired uh, by einstein's uh, work uh, so uh, this is all with respect to frames and uh, one of our main focuses has been to make this derivative have the property 
that it preserves the behavior with respect to frame rotation, which is Lorentz rotation. Okay. Now there's another point of view which doesn't use frames, and it's actually an older point of view. And in a sense, we could have introduced it long ago. Uh, given a Riemannian metric. Um, okay, so we could have introduced it. So the, the reason I've introduced it in this order is because the formula are actually simpler and the sort of geometrical intuition, at least for me, is easier to grasp because this is all happening in the tangent space, not on the manifold. But uh, you, the other point of view would say very good. Suppose we have a GCT vector for example a vector field so as you know a equals a mu del by del x mu is a vector field so vector field so can we differentiate a vector field that's something we've never done yet we differentiated differential forms but we never differentiated vector fields and well let's try so let's try d by dx mu x nu on a mu which I normally write as del nu on a mu. And uh, does this transform as a second rank tensor with one index down and one index up? So your GR books will show you that it doesn't. This doesn't transform properly under GCT. The reason is similar to something we just saw. Under GCT, a mu of x will go to a mu prime of y, which is del y mu by del x nu uh, a nu of x, okay? But now if I take del by del x lambda on this, so del lambda on uh, a, a mu uh, will go to uh, del by del x lambda on delta y mu delta x mu a mu. And now you see the same problem. This thing is going to act once on that, which is fine. It gives me the old one and this gives me the transformation. But then this thing will act on this. And I'll get a second derivative of y, which is not a characteristic of any vector field or tensor field under change of coordinates. Okay, it never involves second derivative of the change of coordinates, only first derivative at that point. Okay, so this is not uh, a good object under GCT. And again, we ask a parallel question, how to remedy this? And we say that, okay, consider D lambda of A mu, to be del lambda of a mu plus capital gamma mu lambda nu a nu. It's somewhat similar to the way we introduced a spin connection, but the difference is that here we are not got any frame trans, we have no frames and no frame transformations. And therefore differentiation introduces a new index. So like omega gamma has three indices two of which are rotation of the original vector and the third one comes from this derivative, okay? So that's just how it is. And uh, so you get this, and this is called uh, the affine connection. And now we play the same game, require uh, that under X goes to Y, require that um, d lambda a mu goes appropriately to del x prime by del x del x by well del y by del x i'll put the indices in a moment so the upper index uh, gives me this so this is uh, mu beta and the lower index gives me this so this is alpha lambda 
I think this is right. In a hurry, I might get it wrong. But this is what we want to require. And that fixes the property of gamma. And we find that gamma goes, uh, so gamma prime uh, in the new coordinate system uh, has a somewhat tedious, uh, so gamma this in, uh, in the y coordinate system is del, I'm just copying from my notes because there's no hope that I can work this out on my own entirely. Uh, y new del x. Uh, I found a typo, horrible. It's terrible to find typos in your own book. Okay. Gamma, alpha, beta, gamma. This is the good one. This, this says that every index transforms under GCT, but then there's another term, del y mu by del x alpha, del two. Again, it involves the second derivative of x alpha with respect to y nu and y lambda. And it's an inhomogeneous term. Okay, so again, there's an inhomogeneous term. Okay, now, uh, so you see that this gives me a covariant derivative, uh, which acting on GCT vector fields uh, gives me uh, GCT tensors. Okay, actually, it gives me uh, mixed covariant and contravariant tensors because the derivative always adds a lower index. Okay, and it's easy to check that the same uh, similar formula holds to this for lower index, but it's different. It is d lambda of b mu is equal to del lambda b mu minus gamma lambda mu alpha b alpha is different from that one in sign. And uh, what you might be thinking, if, you, if you're familiar with the GR point of view and not familiar with the frame point of view, you're probably thinking these look like parallel things. Can't we just, aren't these the same formula? Answer, no, they're not the same formula. They're two different formulae, two sets of different formulae with different properties. And uh, in a few minutes, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about what is the, what are the key differences? Now, uh, let's ask the question, is gamma mu nu lambda unique? Same question that we asked for omega. And the answer is no, again. Okay. So now we need to uh, um, see, so fix both omega and gamma uniquely by some additional conditions. And once we do that, we'll see a nice result. The nice result is that omega will be completely determined in terms of frames and gamma will be completely determined in terms of the metric, okay? So that's the result to look forward to. And the conditions are as follows. Let me try to put them here. This side we are going to do ON frames and this side we are going to do GCT. So the, the, the procedures are quite different but parallel. So on this side, uh, you remember that omega was a one form with two indices A and B, and we didn't say anything about symmetry or anti-symmetry of it. However, there's a very cute calculation. Supposing I take D and I act on the Minkowski metric eta AB by the given rules. Okay, so this is D of eta AB. Remember eta AB is diagonal minus one plus one plus one plus one. So it's this plus omega AC eta CB plus omega um, um, B C eta A C. Now what is capital B on the Minkowski metric? Since the Minkowski metric in general relativity represents flat space time, we should expect that the covariant derivative on flat space time doesn't do anything. It should be zero. But actually this is not fixed uniquely. It could have been non-zero and we would get something 
it just uh, would be much more complicated and it seems reasonable to fix it to be zero. I'll make a comment later on the physics of these choices. Supposing we choose this, it's immediate. You see this term is automatically zero because this is a de derivative and the eta AB of Minkowski spacetime is just a set of constants, so they don't change. This uh, first term becomes omega AB and the second term becomes omega BA. So we find this result, which is anti-symmetry of omega. So this is the first extra condition. So I'll say it is setting omega to be anti-symmetric. That's an auxiliary condition. The second one is to say, well, look, there's a torsion tensor, okay, TA, but we don't have a very friendly interpretation of it. So why don't we just assume that it's an extra thing not directly connected with geometry and set it to zero. If we set the torsion to zero and make omega anti-symmetric, these two conditions, these two, determine uh, omega AB completely. Let's see what we should do on the other side. On the other side, we notice that gamma mu nu alpha also has no definite symmetry in its lower indices. But this time we find an interesting fact that omega alpha mu nu minus omega alpha nu mu is a tensor, even though Sorry, gamma, I should have said not omega, even though gamma is not. So gamma has this inhomogeneous term in its transformation. But if I anti-symmetrize its lower indices, you can easily see from here that the inhomogeneous term drops out because it's a second derivative with respect to precisely these two indices. So if I anti-symmetrize, this term just goes away. And this term, which would remain for the anti-symmetric part of gamma, just says that Gamma, uh, gamma anti-symmetric part is a tensor. Now, very confusingly, this is called the torsion tensor. It's not the one on the left side, okay? Uh, the left side is the torsion one form in the context of frames and, uh, sorry, torsion two form in the context of frames and it's a on vector, but on the right side, uh, the anti-symmetric part of gamma is a torsion tensor. Now, uh, so we'll set this. So our choice will be to set it to zero. So gamma alpha mu nu uh, minus gamma, uh, sorry, alpha nu mu is just zero. So that's one condition. The second condition um, is that the metric, a general metric, uh, should be covariantly constant. This is uh, goes by the name of metricity. And this says that d mu of g alpha beta, which as you know from the definition above, is del mu of g alpha beta minus gamma mu alpha nu g nu beta minus gamma mu beta nu g alpha nu. It's this. So we set this thing to zero. We say that covariant differentiation should have the property that it preserves the Riemannian metric of a manifold, of a Riemannian manifold. So that's an extra condition. And with this, uh, with these two conditions, uh, gamma mu nu alpha is completely determined. In terms of G. Here, this is completely determined in terms of EA and EA, the frames and their duals. Okay. So uh, let me write down the formulae for you. Uh, both the formulae are quite straightforward. Uh, the omega one is actually a bit longer. 
So omega mu AB with the condition of vanishing torsion and of anti-symmetry is that it is half E alpha nu del mu E nu B minus del nu E mu B uh, minus E mu C. This is quite tedious. I don't know any simpler form. Del nu E C sigma minus del sigma E C nu. All this minus mu goes to nu. Sorry, minus A goes to B. There's no, there's no nu in this formula. Minus A goes to B. So what's important is that capital E is our original choice of orthonormal frames for the tangent space. Small e is the dual of that. And as matrices, they are inverses of each other for a fixed uh, basis of frames and a fixed coordinate system. And once I have them, then I can work out this formula, however tedious it is, and get an omega which has the desired transformation properties. This is important because it says that this is not a new degree of freedom. The degrees of freedom that are independent are basically only capital E. Even small e is not new. It's the matrix inverse of capital E. So this is the only degree of freedom in, uh, in our geometry and all the geometries specified in terms of it. Con similarly, if I do this for the on the affine connection side, I find the very famous formula. This one I can actually remember by heart. Uh, so this uh, G beta del uh, beta. Oh, I have difficulty remembering it unless I use the comma notation. So let me use the comma notation. G beta mu nu plus G mu minus G mu beta. This comma is commonly used to be ordinary differentiation. So it's G beta mu comma nu is equal to, is the same as del nu of G beta mu. Uh, textbooks also use a semicolon. This is D nu G beta, B, G beta mu, which is uh, anyway zero by metricity. Okay, so here also we see that once you specify a Riemannian metric on the manifold, uh, you automatically specified an uh, affine connection, but this is not just any affine connection, it is the affine connection under two assumptions, symmetry uh, of the affine connection in its lower indices and metricity under those two conditions, and then it's called the Christoffel symbol. Okay, so that's quite a lot of uh, formalism, but uh, it basically encompasses all the uh, kind of geometrical concepts around Riemannian manifolds. And uh, now I'd like to uh, immediately, uh, I'll take a couple of questions and then I would like to uh, uh, switch to a slightly different, uh, well, I'd like to talk about fermions, yeah. Let's say I'm at a chart, I have a task to rotate from one frame first in the tangent space, then also in cotangent space to the matrix, which I use look like regular orthogonal matrix, lambda, lambda. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the tangent space and cotangent space are defined on the manifold. Huh? They're not defined in the chart. I can write a tangent vector in the chart but the tangent vector has its own independent meaning. That's why we gave this axiomatic definition that X is a tangent vector if it acts on functions F and G by X of F G equals X, XF times G plus F times X G, okay? Doesn't have any reference to charts. That's very important. So if I'm in a chart or I'm not in a chart, uh, the matrices which I use, they, the matrices that I use for rotation of a frame have nothing to do with there being a chart. Does the representation I use at that point in that chart depend on the metric at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you keep saying you're at a point in a chart, but we are never at a point in a chart. We're at a point on the manifold. 
I don't, I, I'm not understanding where charts come into this discussion. We are at a point on the manifold. We have frames on the manifold. Okay, the definition of frames is as a basis for the tangent space. The definition of tangent space is in terms of abstract vectors, capital X, which have this particular action on products of functions, which is linear in the functions and distributes like a derivative. Nowhere we said whether we are in the X coordinates or Y coordinates. So we are not using a chart. So, uh, but what does a lower script index in E mean? E, A, no, of course, E lower A and E upper A are not the same. No, no, but you forgot in my last uh, lecture then, E is always upper A, capital E is always lower A. This is basis of TP of M, and this is a basis of T P star, the dual space, the cotangent space, and it's precisely the dual basis. So E A E B is delta A B. This is always true. This is also true in a pseudo in a Riemannian or pseudo Riemannian uh, uh, metric. This formula is always true. So. Yeah, it's an the point is you could have had any old basis of a tangent space, but is an orthonormal basis, which has a new feature, which says that E A comma E B in the metric G is delta A B. This is new. And in the pseudo Riemannian case, the right hand side would have been replaced by eta. Okay, but you don't see on this page any x or y coordinates. Okay, in the formula for omega, we have E A. Gosh, have I bungled that? Uh, I seem to have bungled that. Uh, no, I haven't. Where is the formula for omega? Let me see. Ah, ah, I wrote it wrong. That's just me. It's also a typo in the book. I'm so sorry. Thank you for bringing that up. This is uh, all, well, it should have been down. You can see that, right? Because on the left side, it's down. This index, so let me write it before I forget. B mu, uh, B mu. Okay. Now the next term, yeah. Here there is something I've done, which I'm a bit confused about. And I think this is because of the metric of the man of the of the, the the Minkowski metric was assumed to raise this. Yeah, let me check this. I think I this was too hasty. I'm sorry. I should have been a little more careful. Uh, e mu c e c sigma. Yeah. Sorry, it, any, anyway, whatever it is, it's my mistake. Uh, probably this should be written as E T mu. And here we should have uh, eta C D for the pseudo Riemannian case. So it's true that we can, uh, we can contract uh, to the point, uh -huh, this is the point, uh, the Tangent, I, I didn't stress this point, but thank you. I think this question has now come up, thanks to you. The metric is an inner product on the tangent space, okay, on tangent vectors, okay? But if I refer things to the frames, then the metric becomes converted to flat, uh, the flat metric, eta AB for the Lorentzian case and delta AB for the, uh, for the Euclidean case. So I can actually use delta AB or eta AB to contract indices of small e and capital E or to raise and lower their indices. And that's what I think I've done unless I made a mistake. I better check that and I'll, I'll, I'll post the correct answer on uh, in the formula for omega, we have E lower A. E is always lower A, I just said that. Uh, Rajneel, I, E has to be lower A. Have I, yeah, so, so the formula for omega I should correct, but everywhere small e should always have lower indices and capital E should always have upper indices. 
Uh, I think this also in my hurry I wrote as alpha, but should have been A. Yeah, this is correct. So the, the, the basic geometry of these objects is always like this. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, so Tanmay, I didn't answer your question, but also because I didn't fully understand why charts have anything to do with it. Charts don't come into that discussion. So the important thing, and I, I, I hope this is useful to you also later when doing physics, uh, for those of you who are in physics, is that chart is the way we understand properties of a manifold, but a manifold is a thing by itself, okay? And tangent space, cotangent space, metric on tangent space, are all things on the manifold, not on the chart. They may be, the chart may be used to calculate things. Uh, even in particular, uh, the chart may be, for all I know, used to calculate omega given a metric or, you know, we can't do any calculations without a chart. But one should not confuse doing a calculation with the conceptual meaning of where, in what space the object is defined. And the objects that I've defined, uh, in particular, the uh, frames, uh, and the Riemannian metric are not defined on the chart, okay? They are defined uh, intrinsically on the manifold. And that's why we started by saying that G mu nu is an inner product between tangent vectors. We could have said it's the distance between neighboring points, okay? But once you start to do that, and then you start to integrate that and minimize it over a finite thing, you always go to a chart to do that. Hmm. But you should appreciate that the, quant the objects are defined independent of charts. And actually it's a very good exercise to try and disentangle what depends on frames, what depends on charts. They are both of them are like a crutch. We lean on them to do something, but they are independent in a way. You might say that, well, life is too complicated with both coordinate charts and uh, frames. And that's true. Without frames, life is simpler. That's why most of the GR textbooks uh, in early times didn't even introduce frames and later when they introduced frames, uh, they did so after explaining the geometry purely from the coordinate point of view. I found it useful to introduce frames for two reasons. One is that it helps us to understand the intrinsic nature of this Riemannian metric as belonging to the manifold and second I'm about to tell you now. So let's have a last 10 minutes of this lecture to be about physics. And let's talk about the Dirac equation. Now, as you know, the Dirac equation, uh, and I just have something here, which I will open so that I don't lose my, don't get my conventions wrong, which is my favorite activity. Uh, excuse me, give me a second. Okay, so I will write the Dirac equation as um, I gamma mu del mu minus M on psi equals zero. I assume that many of you have seen this and are familiar with it. Now there are some hidden indices. Psi is really psi alpha of X, which is a spinner of O, three comma one, the Lorentz group. Okay, and gamma mu maps spinners to spinners. It has these alpha beta indices. So it's a matrix equation. That's the entire point of the Dirac equation uh, was Dirac's cleverness to realize that it's a matrix equation, unlike Maxwell's equations and Klein-Gordon equations. And moreover, the multi-component nature of psi includes the states of the electron and also the positron. So roughly spin up, spin down electron and spin up, spin down positron. Good. Now, how did Dirac, why did Dirac look for this equation to reconcile um, quantum theory with special relativity? And in particular, in quantum theory, uh, we are obliged to have a description for electrons because they are the most common objects that we have. And in fact, all matter is made up of, as we now know, quarks and uh, quarks and electrons, uh, ultimately then protons, neutrons, and electrons. So we need the, uh, an equation which is both relativistic in the special relativity sense and also uh, quantum mechanical. So it's a wave equation for the wave function. 
Now, how do we reconcile uh, quantum theory or quantum mechanics with general relativity? Now, this is not the problem that you may be reading about sometimes uh, of doing quantum gravity. We are not trying to quantize general relativity. All that I've been discussing here is basically the framework and foundation for classical general relativity. But still, in a classical background, such as the gravitational field of the Earth or of a black hole or of a star, I can put an electron. In fact, the concrete problem is how do we study an electron in the field of a black hole. And this is not particularly hypothetical question, even though right now we don't have specific experiment to study a single electron in the field of a black hole. But in fact, there are, you know, black holes are very abundant in the universe and electrons are abundant and uh, processes take place just outside the horizon of a black hole, which involve electrons. And so we should be able to do this. Okay. Now ask your general relativity textbook, if it is one of the standard more elementary books, how you do this. And it's rather depressingly silent on the subject for the following reason. GR without frames allows for uh, vector fields, tensors. Then it allows for one form and tensors of these. Hmm. So this is TP to some power N, uh, well, uh, any any power, let's say I, and this is P star crossed with itself to the power I. All these, it tells you how to differentiate and do various things and write equations. But where in this do you find spinners? And the answer is you don't. And the problem is actually not just uh, forgetting to do something. It's a severe conceptual problem, which is there are no spinner representations of the GCT group, the group of general coordinate transformations. Okay, uh, somebody is unmuted and making a bit of a racket. Can you please check everybody? Uh, sorry, who is it? Okay, anyway, so there are no spinner representations of the GCT group, so you can't do it. So the only way that I know, go to orthonormal frames, now in orthonormal frames, the vector field of electromagnetism A mu, the vector potential, can be converted just by contracting with uh, E, let's say A mu, A mu, the dual frame, uh, we'll get A, A. So we can certainly study the familiar vector potential of electromagnetism in frame language, okay? And in this language, Maxwell's equations would be completely rewritten in frame language. Okay, that's fine, you can do it. Now, on this side, in frame language, you can say, well, O n, also the Lorentz group O n minus one comma one, have special representations called spinner representations. Okay. Moreover, on minus one comma one is a natural place to study these things because that's the Lorentz group uh, with respect to which Dirac made his equation. He made it for special relativity, right? And special relativity has Lorentz symmetry, on minus one comma one. General relativity as originally formulated has general coordinate invariance, which is not O anything. It's just general coordinate transformations, invertible transformations of coordinates. It's rather an ugly group as a group. It is invertible, but beyond that, it's not very pretty. 
But once you go to frames, you have a copy of the special relativistic Lorentz group at every point of the manifold. Hmm? So another term that's often used is local Lorentz basis. Okay, and what we do to get to the local Lorentz basis is precisely this step. If we start with a vector field, we get rid of its vector index, make, make it a general coordinate scalar. Now it doesn't care about general coordinate transformations, but this index rotates it under Lorentz transformations. It's much more intuitive, actually. It much more fits with the spirit of special relativity. And in the same spirit, we can introduce psi alpha as a representation of the Lorentz group O n minus one comma one as a spinner representation. And now we can write the Dirac equation as follows. First define, uh, this is for you, those of you who have done this gamma matrices. I can't explain this in general, but as you know, gamma matrices are special matrices which define the spinner representation of the orthogonal group and they satisfy this property. This is the property Dirac used, okay? These are constant matrices. Now we can define what you might call space-time dependent gamma matrices, gamma mu, as uh, E, sorry, wrong E, this is small e, A, uh, no, this is, that was the right E, E, A, mu, gamma, A, using the frames. So now, because these are constant, these are constant, but these are certainly not constant. The frames vary over the manifold. So these gamma matrices actually vary over the manifold. And now I can write the equation I gamma mu del mu minus M psi equals zero in, okay. Now I could almost write that, but for the fact, the last problem is that the de derivative del. So I've solved one problem, how to get the gamma matrices for the Dirac equation in GR. The next problem is that del mu on psi alpha no longer transforms as an ON spinner. The reason is very simple. It's the same reason. Any non-trivial representation of the orthogonal group will get a factor when I make a frame rotation or a Lorentz transformation. And then differentiating the field will differentiate that factor and give an unwanted term in the transformation. So again, we need to define a covariant derivative, but this time on spinners. And now the beautiful thing is that we can do this. And the answer is del ordinary del mu minus uh, I by four in some conventions, omega mu, this is our friend, the spin connection, times gamma A gamma B commutator. Now the whole thing has indices alpha beta. So actually it is this times psi beta. Here I put a delta alpha beta. So I'm using my omega, but I have to contract away its AB indices, which were acting on vectors to rotate them, to replace them by spinner indices so that it can act on spinners and rotate them. And with this, the Dirac equation is I gamma mu D mu minus M psi equals zero, which is Dirac equation on arbitrary space time. So a simple question like what is the Dirac equation on arbitrary space time has no solution if we don't have frames on the manifold. And it has a very simple solution if we have frames, namely the frames enter in the definition of gamma mu because of this relation. And the frames uh, indirectly also enter in, well, directly actually enter in the definition of D because D contains omega and omega depends on the frames. So through frames, we define the Dirac equation on a curved or general space time. So this uh, is one of the reasons why I felt it's essential to start with frames because they give a more modern outlook. A very funny historical fact is that although frames were obviously known to people like Cartan and spinner representation, I guess he was the one who invented that too. But in the physics community, until the mid 1970s, which is not so long ago, 
um, yeah, I know many of you were not born, but I was uh, in fact doing my PhD at the time. Uh, it was not widely appreciated. So the textbooks of GR at, at that time had little mention of frames and no mention of fermions uh, or fermion or Dirac equation on a curved space time. Once supergravity became a subject of research in 1976 or thereabouts, that's when people realized the essential nature of frames because in supergravity you have fermion partners of this metric and now uh, you can't do without frames to write the Lagrange. Okay, so that's what I have to say for today. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. How is this covariant derivative similar or different than the covariant derivative which we get due to internal symmetries, Rajneel? Excellent question. Excellent question. And the answer is actually so simple. Uh, all covariant derivatives uh, internal as in Yang Mills, you know that, you know, the Yang Mills covariant derivative that you're asking about capital D mu is del mu minus I A mu, even Maxwell equation, even uh, uh, or, or Yang Mills. Also uh, space time, e.g. Uh, gamma or frame like omega are connections on a fiber bundle. So they all have the same universal behavior and they all, um, uh, they all, as I said, are connections on a fiber bundle. And uh, basically what it's saying uh, is that you have your manifold, above that you have a structure called the fiber. In the case of frames, that fiber is the tangent space. In the case of uh, Yang-Mills theory, that fiber is the representation space uh, under which your fields transform, okay, under an internal symmetry. The formulae are universal and in particular, they are identical for Yang-Mills and for frames. They are a bit different for the space-time, but for Yang-Mills and frames, they are quite the same. So you could say that Yang and Mills could have discovered their internal symmetries if they had read Cartan's work very carefully because Cartan talked about frames and frames involve ON rotations and Cartan's equations can be transported to write ON Yang-Mills theory. Now, if you want to write SUN Yang-Mills theory, which is a different group, it's only it only differs in detail. The concept is quite the same. And probably you would have noticed when I wrote R equals D omega plus omega wedge omega, uh, which was somewhere here, uh, right here, that this is also the Yang-Mills field strength. F is also D A plus A wedge A. It's the same equation. The only difference is that A acts in an internal space and omega acts in the tangent space, which is also an auxiliary space related to the manifold. Okay, so thank you. That was a very good question. Uh, and that seems to be all the questions and we are quite late. So if there are no more pressing questions, I will end, yeah. Do people still work in einstein cartan theory of gravity? Yes. And in fact, they even work in something called newton cartan theory of gravity, which is an exotic version of gravity, exotic from modern point of view, which tries to apply Cartan's ideas to Newtonian rather than Einstein in gravity. Uh, but you know, when you say work in Einstein Cartan theory of gravity, um, I think uh, as far as the formula I've presented, they're all well known. It's more of a tool. Uh, so you, you have your gravity theory, you formulate it in Einstein Cartan language and then you can do certain things with it. One of which is to study fermions. It's a, one of the most important goals in physics. Almost 95% of physics or maybe more studies fermions, studies electrons actually. So, so yeah, it, in that sense, but it's a tool. I wouldn't say that it's a subject of active research though there may be things still not known, I'm not sure. Okay, let's stop here, uh, please. Uh,